This is translated from a German lexicon that was done in 1971. It covers over 6,000 keywords in the Bible. Are you a wide angle, big picture type of person or zoomed in on the details? Exacto knife or Swiss Army knife? That's the question for today. In the last video, I looked at the big picture tools, Bible dictionaries or encyclopedias. In this video, we're gonna look at Bible lexicons, often what we call dictionaries, which really just makes the whole issue so cloudy. Think of dictionaries or lexicons that we're gonna look at today as sort of the exacto knife or take on a microscopic view of the biblical text. In the previous video, we looked at sort of the big picture or sort of the Swiss army knife type approach. As you can see, I'm rocking a new wardrobe feature. I thought I needed to address this because I ask questions about it anyways. I went for a 150 mile mountain bike ride from Grand Junction to Moab over three days I've done this ride around eight times in the past, but this time I crashed about 20 miles from the end. Not a bad crash, but it did give me this souvenir, which has made it really hard to get things done around the house and especially around the office, like typing, setting up camera gear, but luckily coffee making is not hampered too much. But I digress. Let me get back to lexicons and explain how lexicons are different from other types of dictionaries. So how are the dictionaries in this video different from the Bible dictionaries I covered in the last video? And you can take a look at that over here. The Bible dictionaries I covered in the last video are more like one volume encyclopedias on places, people, things, events, customs, practices, or beliefs within the Bible. And just to make things even more confusing, sometimes they're called encyclopedias, like the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. In this video, we're gonna look at Bible dictionaries that are closer to lexicons, and see my last video for why they call them that. But to cut a long story short, it involves monks in medieval monasteries, a long historical tradition, and scholars from several hundred years ago working on biblical and other works from antiquity, and the Latin term for the dictionaries that they used then was lexicons, and we still use that term today. But I think it's easier to explain the differences if I just show you. Let's take, for example, the important word apostle. If I look that up in InterVarsity's Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, we have an 11-page discussion on what the word apostle means. We have Jesus called the apostles, who the 12 apostles were, and what their role in the early church was. In Vine's expository dictionary, a lexicon type of dictionary that we're looking at this week, we first off look up the word apostle, and the first thing we have is a transliteration of the term, basically how you would spell the Greek word in English. So we can double check if we're on the right word. Then we have about a half page definition of what the word means with references to instances where this word is used in the New Testament. Oftentimes these differences, 11 pages versus a half page, will be even greater. A good Bible dictionary like we covered last week will give you a basic definition of the term, but they're also gonna cover a lot fewer terms and they're gonna take a much more big picture or Swiss army knife view of the term. A lexicon type of dictionary that we're looking at this week is a much more precise term. They zero in on what that word means based on how it was used in literature during that time and in the biblical text. Now there's a lot of different lexicon type dictionaries that are available for the Bible. So to narrow down my search and to help you some, I've got several criteria that I'm going to use. The first criteria is it needs to be accessible to English readers. It doesn't require Greek or Hebrew or a seminary degree. This means that you look up the English word. You don't need to find a Strong's number or its transliteration. You don't look it up by the Greek word. You just look it up like you would in a regular English dictionary. Second criteria. They are not overly technical in their discussions. If you don't know Greek or Hebrew grammar or morphological constructions, then why get bogged down in discussions about the significance of these grammatical features? 
third criteria, they make use of contemporary research. Now, this is actually a pretty easy criteria because almost all the dictionaries we're looking at today have been written in the last 60 or 50 years. So they make use of really good contemporary research. Number four, I can't count to four on that hand. Number four, it's key to Strong's or the GK numbering system, and they are available in software. These features are very useful if you're using a translation different from the primary translation that the dictionary uses. Number five, it includes the Greek or Hebrew word or a transliteration of the original word. Now, just like the Strong's or the GK number allows you to double check to make sure you have the right word, Oftentimes, the different resources will give you a translation of the Greek word. You may not know the original Greek, but when you're looking up that word's definition, oftentimes it includes a transliteration, and you just kind of spot check it, sight check it to see if they look the same. This is also very useful if you know the original languages. You can see if the correct word is being discussed. And criteria number six. My overall goal is to select resources that are the easiest for English speakers to use without a knowledge of the original languages, or needing to jump through a secondary source like Strong's or a Bible software package to use them. Enough preliminaries, let's get into a discussion of these dictionaries. Number one, Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. William Edwin Vine really put this type of lexicon or dictionary on the map when he produced this in 1940. It has served decades of students, pastors, and laymen alike and continues to be reprinted and continues to be widely used today. It was first published in 1940 and has shown some age, but it is still a pretty good lexicon or dictionary to use. In the introduction, he writes, the present volume is produced especially for the help of those people who do not study Greek, though it is hoped that those who are familiar with their original language will also find it useful. Now, Vines distinguishes the shades of meaning and connotation that may be lost in the English translation if there are several Greek words. For example, if we look at the discussion of the word love, we find that he covers two different Greek verbs and two different Greek nouns. Now, the original Vines was based on the English words in the American Standard Version. In 1985, Vines was updated and supplemented by doubling its size to include words contained in the Old Testament. Thus, we now have Vines Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words, not just New Testament words, but Biblical Words. This is published by Thomas Nelson and it was produced in 1985. This current volume combines Vines Popular Dictionary with Nelson's Expository Dictionary of the Old Testament that was published in 1980. Now, they also added Strong's numbering to this dictionary and it is more up to date and includes all the information found in the original Vines dictionary and also Nelson's Old Testament dictionary. My recommendation is, is that if you're looking at picking up one of these three dictionaries, Vines, Nelson's, or Vines Dictionary of Biblical Words, I would say get the latter, Vines Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words. It covers over 6,000 keywords in the Bible. Next up, New International Encyclopedia of Bible Words, done by Lawrence Richards in 1985. This was originally titled Zondervan Expository Dictionary of the Bible Words, but it got retitled. I have a software edition of this encyclopedia, and it's also available in all three of the big software packages, Accordance, Logos, and Olive Tree. So if you got one of those, you can download this for a very reasonable price. In print, it is 736 pages long. Now, that's a pretty hefty dictionary. As opposed to Vines that was based on the American Standard Version, Richard's work uses the NIV and New American Standard Bibles, but also will key into certain King James words because of its popularity. It also is keyed to the GK numbering system, not Strong's. In the preface, Richards writes, when we read a word like hope or judge in the Bible, we frequently fail to read it with the Bible's own meaning. Instead, we read it with meanings shaped by our society and our personal experiences. Instead of being reshaped by the Bible's message, we ourselves reshape that message by imposing our meanings on it. 
And so that's a great example of why these lexicon type dictionaries are so important. In compiling this lexicon, Richards did not do a great deal of original language research, but instead he made use of research done by biblical and classical scholars to compile his dictionary. His goal was to make their work as accessible to someone who is not trained in the biblical languages, and I really applaud his effort in this area. In contrast to the updated Vines, which covers some 6,000 words, Richards focuses on 1,500 words. A lot less, but 1,500 words is still a lot of words, and I challenge anyone out there to read all 1,500 definitions if you think that's fairly limited or comprised compromised in some way. His discussions of different words often include a devotional tone or message within them. Now this can either be a strength or a weakness depending on what you're looking for in a dictionary. This brings us to our next dictionary, Mounts' Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, done by William Mounts in 2006. William Mounts has really made a name for himself with his Greek primer and other tools that he's published to help people understand the Greek New Testament. His dictionary is a great extension of that work to those who have not studied their original languages, but want to know something about them. All told, this work is slightly over 1,300 pages long in print. I really appreciate his introductory chapter on how to do word studies. He offers clear, common sense advice on how to do a word study, and this chapter may be worth the price of the book alone. The bulk of this lexicon is his English to Hebrew or Greek lexicon. Each of the English words discussed first includes the discussion of the Old Testament, then the New Testament uses if it's in both Testaments. It includes a transliteration of the word and is keyed to the GK numbering system with the Strong's number often given in parentheses after this and then is followed by how many times that Greek or Hebrew word is used in the Bible. Mounts' complete expository dictionary covers every word that is used 50 times or more in the Hebrew and Greek words that occur more than 10 times in the New Testament. Moving right along, we come to the expository dictionary of Bible words, edited by Stephen Wren in 2005. I know all these books are really beginning to sound a lot alike, but I'm going to have links to all of them underneath this video to my affiliate account at Amazon. And I appreciate if you're going to pick one up in print version, hit those links and use that. I don't get a lot of money, but it helps me pay for what I spend on this channel. Anyways, in the preface to his book, Wren states that this dictionary is designed as a non-technical reference book for pastors, teachers, and lay students of the scripture. Like the other works, you look it up by the English word, and then underneath that it has a discussion of the Hebrew and then the Greek terms, and a transliteration of them as well. One feature of this dictionary that I think many will find useful is an additional note section in some of the definitions. This section explains how the theme, concept, or doctrine shaped by that Hebrew concept is then fulfilled in the Greek vocabulary of the New Testament. This helps you to see how these ideas and concepts developed over time. Finally, we come to the grand queen mother of them all, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, edited by Colin Brown. This is translated from a German lexicon that was done in 1971, but was translated into English in 1986, and it's published by Zondervan. If you have difficulty locating this, you're not alone. That's because they updated this version and the original is kind of out of print, but you can find it on numerous used sites. Now what happened is Moises Silva edited and updated this dictionary and it's published as, believe it or not, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology and Exegesis. So the first one is referred to as Nidnit and this is referred to as Nidnit E. While Silva's update does incorporate better linguistic principles, it is not really accessible for someone who doesn't know Greek. For example, in Nidnit E, it's organized by Greek words, but in Nidnit, you look them up by the English word. So I'm going to focus on Nidnit in this discussion 
because it's much more accessible if you don't know Greek or Hebrew. As a side note, there's also a Hebrew version of this, the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. Now notice how creative theologians are in referring to works like this. The original New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology is referred to as Nidnet. Then we have Silva's update, Nidnet E, the E for exegesis at the end. Then we have Nidot, New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. I think that Nidnet is the 800 pound gorilla in terms of dictionaries for the New Testament for students of an English Bible. It is three or four volumes long, depending on the printing edition that you get, and it contains very lengthy discussions of Greek words and their theological significance. Some of them can be over 40 pages long. And for someone in college or graduate school, each article contains a thorough bibliography at the end, though dated to the 1980s. This will allow you to do more research on those terms. In 2003, an abridged version of this was published, a one-volume New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. Sometimes it's titled as the NIV Theological Dictionary of the New Testament Words. For some reason, this one-volume edition is easier to find these days, and they did an excellent job editing down the four volumes into one. So I highly recommend this one-volume abridged version. But if you can find the four-volume version, and you're kind of OCD about things like this, it's well worth ponying up the extra money. All of these are excellent resources that will take you way beyond what you will find in concordances limited definitions at the back. And it's worth your while to add at least one of these to your library. And as I said, I've got links to the print version underneath this video, or if you've got one of the software packages, you can download it that way as well. I hope you found this survey useful. And remember to hit the subscribe button and let others know about the channel. If you haven't seen my previous video on Bible dictionaries, you can click over here on this thumbnail to see it. Over here is a link to the video that YouTube thinks you need to watch next. And don't argue with YouTube, they always know best. Until we meet again, peace.